The title of the talk today is Truth and Illusion in Philosophy and Theatre. Um, and as you've got up there, uh, my name's Tom Stern. I'm in the philosophy department at UCL. And the presentation today is based on some research that I've just completed. It's a book on philosophy and theatre, an introduction to them. And it's really thinking about the way that philosophy relates to theatre, the sorts of topics that might come up. So, uh, for example, I talk about things like um, representation, uh, what does theatre, how does theatre relate to the world that it purports to represent, um, politics, what is political theatre, how can theatre be political, um, the emotions uh, and morality, and in this case, truth and illusion. Now, for many philosophers presenting in a forum like this, uh, it's both a great opportunity, but it can also be somewhat intimidating, because I think a lot of lectures, especially public lectures, are done with a certain kind of format in mind, the format in mind being that the person who's talking to you is a researcher, and the, the researcher has gone away and done some some, maybe some empirical research, uh, or maybe some archival research, has discovered some new findings and wants to present those findings uh, to you and is trying to find an accessible way to present them. Now, perhaps in a sense that's what's going on in philosophy, but I think in another important sense it, 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 it isn't typical of what philosophers do, because quite often I think certainly contemporary philosophers, what they're doing is something slightly different um, and the best way I can think of explaining that, just to prepare you for, for what's coming, um, is that it's not exactly presenting a series of research findings, a series of claims about how the world is. It, it feels a bit more like uh, the analogy uh, to something I used to do at school. Um, the, the, the thing that we used to do at school, which, which they called uh, chromatography, which is where you take a kind of thick... Um, a thick drop of some, some ink and you put it onto blotting paper and when it goes into the blotting paper um, it, it, it opens out into a lot of different colours and you see the whole thing more clearly but you know you haven't you, you haven't necessarily proved a hypothesis but, but maybe you've become clearer about this kind of thick and in the case of philosophy it's often concepts, these, these concepts that you use or that you think about and that what maybe philosophers can do is open those out and, and maybe reveal some of the colours, the different colours uh, that were always present in them, but you hadn't necessarily kept apart. Anyway, uh, for today's topic, which is truth and illusion in philosophy and theatre, I think that is very much the model that I'm going to be trying to go for, which is to say um, these are both obviously quite large, quite thick uh, concepts. If they were ink, they would be uh, ink made up of many different colours, and to kind of drop them onto the blotting paper and see how they open out. Okay. So first I want to say a little bit about philosophy and theatre and why those two things might be interesting things to think about. Like what, why, why, why do they belong together? I mean, apart from the fact that you, know, you may be interested in both, but is there a more, is there a deeper reason why those two things might be worthy of study? And uh, the suggestion I have for a way of thinking about that is to start thinking about their past their history, their origins. So it's not much of an exaggeration to say that philosophy and theatre, certainly as we understand them now in their Western context, are, are, are roughly speaking, are twins. Right? They're, they're born in the same place and they're born at the same time, which is um, the Greek-speaking world of more or less the 6th century BC. Um, but uh, they're not just twins in the sense of being born in the same place at the same time. They're twins in another sense, uh, which is that they have quite a troubled or difficult relationship to one another from the start. If you know any twins, you'll know something about what I mean. So uh, it's not just that they start at the same place at the same time, it's that they interact, and they interact in quite a complicated way. I've just put four names up, and I'm going to use those four names to build up the sort of complex interaction that I'm talking about and to introduce the topic, which is going to be my main focus. So, most of you will know about Socrates. Socrates, the first, um, well, from the starting point for uh, Western philosophy, 
by no means the very first philosopher, but the first philosopher we spend a lot of time talking about. And Socrates writes nothing down. We have one source on Socrates which was written during his lifetime. We have plenty afterwards, but only one source written during his lifetime. And that source is a play. It's a play by Aristophanes, and it's a play which depicts Socrates um, as uh, not so much a philosopher, but a kind of trickster. So it's a comedy. Socrates invites students into his school. Uh, when they come into his school, he does things like uh, trick them out of money. He teaches them to make spurious arguments according to whatever it is that they want to do. He steals from them. Um, and most importantly, he corrupts their views about religion. These are a very religious people, and Socrates is telling them that the gods that they've believed in up to now are not the real gods. So some, some, some researchers think that the way Socrates was introduced onto the stage in this play was exactly the same way that they conventionally introduced gods in the tragedies. In other words, the play is depicting God, uh, Socrates as somebody who thinks of himself as a god, and certainly he tells his students, you know, there's no such thing as Zeus, don't believe in Zeus anymore. So it's somebody who's both corrupting the gods, sorry, corrupting the youth, and, and, and undermining the city's gods. Now, those of you who know what happened next might be able to see the significance of this. There's one story which has Socrates going to the play, watching the play, and enjoying it, and standing up so that people who can bear real Socrates to fake Socrates on the stage. But whether or not that's true, what's certainly true is that Socrates was put to death, and he was put to death for corrupting the youth, and he was put to death for not believing in the gods of the city. In other words, he's put to death for the very thing that he's mocked for in the plays. And when his pupil, Plato, wrote a defence speech for Socrates, what he wrote Socrates saying was, well, I can argue with the charges against me, but it's very difficult to argue against people's general preconceptions of me. And most people think that that is in some way an allusion or a reference to this play, because after all, many of the people who voted to kill Socrates would have seen the play in which Socrates was depicted doing exactly the things that they subsequently condemned him to death for. So Plato writes this apology speech, um, but he also writes a dialogue in which uh, Socrates meets Aristophanes, the playwright who mocks him, and Socrates outthinks him, and Socrates also very importantly outdrinks him too. Uh, th 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 these are the Greeks, after all. And finally, and most famously, he, he, he has Socrates and his friends um, imagining the ideal city, and the ideal city is going to be a place where there are no playwrights and there are no actors, or if there are those things, there are those things only in a very restricted, unrecognisable way. Um, the main charge, or one of the main charges, being that people will believe the stupid things that they see on stage, that theatre has a certain kind of power over people to make them believe things which are false, and it's not too much of a stretch of the imagination to think that when Plato writes Socrates talking about these things, he has in mind the play that people saw which showed Socrates doing the things which Socrates was subsequently put to death for. And I wouldn't want to complete this brief summary without a mention of Aristotle. Again, it's speculative, but for many scholars, Aristotle writes his poetics. He gave these classes to his students on poetry, and in particular on tragedy. Right? He writes his poetics, many people think, in response to those claims by Plato. So Plato says the playwrights are dangerous, ban them from the city. Whether or not he's responding to Plato, Aristotle clearly thinks that there's an importance to drama, and it's important to understand how it works, to understand its rationality. Now that document, the poetics, or what remained of it, was used as a blueprint for how to write good plays, for a long time in the European tradition, which means that you can tell a certain kind of story, if you want to, it's speculative, but it's not that speculative, that if Plato wouldn't have written the things he'd written without Socrates dying, if Socrates hadn't died without this play in people's minds, if Aristotle hadn't written his poetics in response to Plato, and if all these people hadn't used Aristotle as the model for how to write plays, you can say that Philosophy and theatre would be completely unrecognisable without one another. I mean, our, our notions of them are fixed in some sense by the history of the other one. 
So look, that's a purely historical way into thinking why these things might have something to say to each other. And what I want to talk about more in a moment is their conceptual relation. And to get a grip on their conceptual relation, just note this. Um, both of the words we have for them are from the Greek. Um, philosophy comes from the word for the love of wisdom. And theatre comes from the Greek word for a place for viewing. Right? And when I'm talking about truth and illusion in philosophy and theatre, I think you can almost see the conflict already in the words. To what extent can the place for viewing, to what extent can a place which is fundamentally about show, you might say, also be a place where you love wisdom? Now, you might think, for example, that this was a case where that was true. In a sense, we're all in a place for viewing. This is clearly set up uh, uh, in order for you to be able to see me and for me to be able to see you, that's clearly the case. But it also, uh, at least in theory, I make no promises, might be associated with the love of wisdom. But in theatre, where there are these often fictional stories, where they often thought to be a, a, a venue for illusions, we'll get into that more in a moment, is there not some kind of a clash between the pursuit of the love of wisdom and the idea of putting on a great show? This is my favourite slide of the talk. Um, I didn't realise I was going to be photographed today, but you know this seems like the opportunity. Philosopher, <laughs> philosopher, truth. I don't know. I, I, I should think of some 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 better pose. Okay. So I began the 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 the, the, the work that this talk is based on began with the thought that I, I noticed two different strands when I read. History of theatre, history of philosophers writing about theatre, many philosophers did. Um, theatre theorists defending theatre or attacking other kinds of theatre. You, you can't help but notice two strands of thought which look like they go uh, against each other and that's often a way in for philosophical thinking when you have two, two apparently opposed thoughts about the same thing. Um, one of them was associated with truth. It's the thought that um, theatre, theatrical performances, perhaps art more generally, though I'm, I'm sticking to theatre today, um, is, a, is a special or particularly useful or particularly good vehicle for conveying truth. Um, if you listen to what playwrights think they're doing, or if you listen to the way that directors talk about what they're doing, or even actors, they'll often say, um, that, that what's so exciting about this is it's, it's a way of conveying certain kinds of truths or certain kinds of knowledge people, a special way of doing that. I think that's on the one hand. On the other hand, you can't help but notice the accusations that theatre is somehow associated with deception, with illusion, um, with uh, uh, falsehoods, uh, um, 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 appearing to know more than you really know is the classic Plato charge, but there are also lots of others. If you read novels a lot, and especially 19th century novels, you'll notice that many of the uh, deceptive events tend to be set at theatrical performances. It's as if the novelists are saying, look, I'm not the one that's deceiving you. The theatre is really where it happens. So you often get communication between people at theatres which is somehow undermined <coughs> because it's a venue for falsehood. So what I want to do is look at those two thoughts. On the one hand, can it be, what would it mean for it to be uh, a vehicle for truth? On the other hand, is it, what would it mean for it to be a place for illusion, and how do those two things relate to each other? Um, if you want to claim that a theatrical performance is true or conveying truth uh, or conveying knowledge, um, where would you look for its knowledge or truth? Where would, you, where would you go for? Well, one place you might think about is the words of the play. Um, it, it, during the course of a play, typically, lots of things get said. Of course, there are some plays where there are no words at all, but often there are conversations between people, there are climactic statements at the end, there are words of wisdom that are expressed by the characters. Perhaps that's a good place to look for truth. But of course, as many of you will probably be thinking, uh, that's a very problematic place to look for truths in a play. And we might have reasons to think that that's not the best place to go. So, for example, lots of the claims or lots of the, the, lots of the sentences that are uttered by people during the course of plays are not really the kinds of things that are true or false at all. 
the opening line of Hamlet is who's there? Like, that's a question. Questions aren't true or false, they're, they're questions. The final line of Hamlet, which is go bid the soldiers shoot, that's an order. Like, orders are not the kind of thing that are true or false. And even when people make statements in plays, characters make certain kinds of claims, often it's within a certain kind of dramatic context. They're not standing there and saying, here's how the world is. They're trying to persuade someone of something, or they're being, their character is being illustrated to you in a certain sense. So for all those reasons, lots of the claims in plays just don't look like the right kinds of things for truth at all. Now you might say, well, a play like Hamlet is full of all sorts of words of wisdom that could be distilled and taken out of the play, and that might well be true. So uh, uh, one of my favorite examples of these is when someone is told never to lend money to a friend because you tend to lose both the money and the friend. Right? That seems like a wise piece of advice. But even then, I'm a bit worried that that's not really the kind of truths that we're after. Right? Here's one reason why you might think that it isn't. Imagine I went through Hamlet, the text, or one of the texts, and I just crossed out everything that wasn't one of those nice words of wisdom, nice little nuggets of wisdom, and I just left all the nuggets of wisdom. And then I came in today and I just read them all out to you. Would you think that you'd learned the same thing? Would you think that you'd had access to the same kind of truth that you might think if you'd seen the play as a whole? And I suspect the answer to that is no. Right? By isolating all of these claims, I've missed something. And then the question would be, of course, what is it? What's more, if it's just a question of making a series of statements, you open yourself up to the problem that Plato sets up at the beginning, which is, well, who, who gives the playwright the authority to make these statements? What is it about, how does a playwright get to learn these sorts of things? How is he or she in such a position to make that kind of claim, and why should we believe him or her? So I think we should leave the world of statements for a moment, claims within the play, and think about something else. Because for Aristotle, for example, I don't think it's a question of the statements or the words that are uttered in a play. I think it's something more like the types of action or the types of things that go on during the course of the performance. So what he says about plays is that the reason why they're important, or one of the reasons why they're important, is that they show us universals. And by universals, what he means is uh, how things either always happen or how things typically happen. What plays are good at is showing us how things typically happen and we can learn from that. These are somehow scenarios that are maybe universal or just maybe common, boiled down to their basic elements and illustrated beautifully for us. And again, I want to suggest that there are just a couple of problems with that, though I think it's more promising. Because for any one play, you'd have to tell me what the universal or what the typical thing on display was. Let's take a play that Aristotle knew and liked, which was Sophocles' Oedipus. Now, we all know the story of Sophocles' Oedipus. Oedipus uh, having tricked the Sphinx, um, having killed his father and having married his mother, learns about all those horrible <coughs> truths and comes to a kind of terrifying, sickening realisation. Now, what's the universal type of situation that's being explored in that play? It presumably isn't the story of somebody who's killed his father, married his mother, and outwitted a sphinx, coming to have a terrible realization. Because to put it bluntly, that isn't a very typical situation. Um, I've never met anybody <laughs> who's outwitted a sphinx, let alone the rest of it. <coughs> If you have, please let me know afterwards, and I will use it in the next version of this talk. But, for those of us who haven't, what's the typical situation? Aristotle clearly thought there was one. I mean, it's not a mad thought, but what is it? Well, some people have said things like, look, this is a story about pride, right? because he's a very proud person, and it's about how pride, in some sense, is associated with a fall from pride. Um, maybe that's the story. Um, except that... I don't think that's a good account of the play itself, because um, the whole point about Oedipus, it seems to me at least, is that whatever he did, he was going to have this terrible fall. Um, it's not because of his pride that he's brought down. Um, it's because he's fated, or maybe his pride was also fated. In any case, it doesn't look to me like it's a moral fable about pride. Um, nor is it necessarily a story about how great people will always be brought down, um, because Again, um, it's not great people in general that are brought down, it's 
great people who are fated to be brought down, and that makes things much more complicated. So anyway, um, we can talk about interpretations of Oedipus more, but the point is, it's always going to be an open question what type of thing is being on display, being put on display here, unless you go for the literal story. And the literal story is probably going to be something very unusual. So those are some reasons for thinking that looking for truth in plays, even though it's a popular and, and a, an appealing notion, might be more problematic. At least we might want to distinguish the sorts of things we mean or the sorts of places that we might want to look. And now I want to talk or turn our attention to the notion of illusion, to the idea that plays are in some sense uh, venues or focuses for illusions. If you read theatre theory and if you read philosophy about theatre, you'll often come across the term <coughs> illusion as though it's one clear thing. And what I want to suggest is it's not one clear thing and that it's a relationship between deception, false belief, misunderstanding, falsehood, all those sorts of things, will vary hugely depending on the sort of illusion that you have in mind. So um, I'm just going to begin with one example. The first kind of illusion that I want to look at is what I'm going to call optical illusions. Like you're probably all familiar with optical illusions. Um, this is an optical illusion called the Fraser spiral. Um, and you might be thinking, uh, what's illusory about the Fraser spiral? And the answer is that the Fraser spiral is not at all a spiral. Uh, it's actually a series of concentric rings. There is no spiral. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, yes, it is a spiral, and that I've given you the wrong picture. Um, if you want to check, what I'd like you to do is look at the third ring, follow your finger around the third ring, and what you'll find is that you end up in the place that you started. Um, now, at this point, when I give this talk, there's normally one or two people who say, no, I didn't. I spiralled <laughs> into the middle. And that's actually philosophically quite interesting, because obviously I'm appealing to the idea that you did as a proof that it's not a spiral, and then we have to have a conversation about the burden of proof. And uh, uh, rather than do that, trust me, you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it isn't, and if you don't believe me, I, I don't know whether this even helps, but I, uh, anyway, um, look, you know, just look, there we are, promise you, Definitely not. Uh, definitely not a spiral. Now, here's an interesting thing about the Fraser spiral if you're interested in the relationship between illusion and false beliefs. This is something that philosophers have talked about in relation to illusion for quite a while now. Um, here's the interesting thing. I'm going to take you back to before I've proved to you that it's not. Here's the spiral. Now let's suppose you all agree with me that this isn't a spiral, that it's a series of concentric rings. Now I want you to look at the Fraser spiral. What are you seeing? Are you seeing a series of concentric rings, or are you seeing a spiral? The answer is you're all still seeing a stupid spiral, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Even though you now know it isn't one. I haven't done anything tricky, tricky here. It's still the same picture. Now, what that means is that you can be subject to an illusion like this, um, while having no false belief about it whatsoever. You're not... You're not you don't believe it's a spiral, but you are, in some sense, the victim of an illusion. So theatre, it seems to me, doesn't rely heavily on the notion of optical illusions, but there are, I think, some, or certainly some analogous things that are going on. It depends how far you stretch the term optical illusion and how you define it. But clearly, there are ways of arranging a stage so that you're going to think that things are symmetrical, for example, where they aren't. It was a famous way of using raked stages, which were those sloped stages, so that the perspective was altered and people wouldn't realise. They would only realise if somebody walked across the back, because the person walking across the back would be way too large for where they were supposed to be. So often what they used to do in, old, uh, in some old-fashioned traditional theatre, they would actually get children to dress up like adults, and they would walk them back at the back of the stage, the back of the raked stage, so that the perspective wasn't ruined. But clearly, there are tricks of perspective in, uh, at work in plays. And in those cases, as I say, you can know that it's an illusion and not be deceived, but still, in some sense, be the victim of it. So that's just to say, just to make the point, that something can be illusory but not generating necessarily falsehoods. OK. The second kind of thing I want to consider is the illusions of what you might call the illusionist or the Houdini type illusion. 
Now here I want to suggest something slightly different is going on. Because it doesn't have the same structure as the first one. The first kind was, you look at something, it's static, there's something in the image which misleads you, but once you're corrected, you still see the fact that it's an you're still a victim of the illusion even once you're corrected. Okay, so that was that case. And now imagine a kind of Houdini scenario. Right? This is adapted from something that people think Houdini might have done. Of course, his actual uh, practices are shrouded in you know, mystery, but here's, here's a kind of Houdini-type case. Okay? Uh, Houdini is locked up in chains, his hands are handcuffed, his uh, whole body is surrounded by metal, it's very difficult to escape from, and locked tightly, and he, the assistant locks it up, throws away the key, and shoves him into some water, um, having sort of given him a farewell kiss goodbye. Then a curtain is drawn, and then, of course, magically, 30 seconds later, out comes Houdini. Now, one thing people think that happened in these kinds of scenarios is that at the moment of the farewell kiss goodbye, the assistant kind of slips him a key. Okay, and that's how the illusion comes about. It comes about because there's a sleight of hand in the action. Now, I just want you to compare that to the case of the phaser spiral where telling you how it's done doesn't affect your experience of the illusion. Because I bet if we watched Houdini together, just at the pivotal moment, I nudge you and I say, hey, I bet there's a key in there. I'll bet that, that ruins the effect. Right? It, it, it is dependent, unlike the other case, it is dependent on having a certain kind of false belief about it. So in as much as those kinds of illusions are going on, what I'm suggesting is um, it does actually make a difference what sorts of beliefs you do and don't have about what's going on. Now, in the case of theatre, uh, as it, by which I mean sort of content conventional dramatic theatre, slightly more complicated than that. So, for example, um, I think there are Houdini-type events going on at all sorts of levels in actors. Actors are very good at sleight of hand, at distracting you, at taking your attention away from certain things so you, so you don't notice other things, that sort of thing. Um, and if you want to think about examples, just crudely think about maybe a case where, um, uh, where actors are portraying violence and it looks as though sort of an enormous amount of violence is being done to someone, but actually there's some kind of trick going on, a fake, there's simply a fake punch or a faked fight. Now, it seems to me like there, there are cases where there's a parallel structure to the Houdini case. If you knew what was really going on, if you really realised that this person isn't injured, or is, if you could <coughs> see where the fake blood capsule was, or if you could see how the sword isn't really going in, or whatever it is, then it would, in some sense, ruin your appreciation or your enjoyment of the spectacle, of the play, or it, it would, in some sense, undermine things. And in that case, it's different from the first case. The first case, the beliefs about it didn't change your experience, but in the second case, perhaps, they do. All right. And the final one, before I talk about the relationship between the three of them, the final kind of illusion I want to think about, and this is really what a lot of people have in mind when they talk about illusion, at the theatre. The final example I wanted to give you is what I would call being under the spell. Now, being under the spell is being absorbed in the action. So, the illusion meaning not some particular trick within the action, or not the way the stage is set up so that it looks a way that it isn't, but rather being kind of lost in it, absorbed in it. Um, it's rather like uh, Nietzsche has a term for this when he's talking about this sort of illusion. And he says it's like a dream that you know is a dream, but you want to keep dreaming it. That's that sort of experience at the play. Now, that isn't like being outwitted by a Houdini-type magician. And it certainly isn't looking at a spiral and thinking it's a spiral when it isn't. Right? It, it's something that involves you to a much greater degree. And the question is, the question that I want to think about is, you know, does being under the spell mean that you really believe that what's going on is going on? So are you experiencing a series of false beliefs about the action? Um, are you suspending your false beliefs? Are you sort of participating in the ways that some people have suggested? You know, or are you just kind of absorbed? Right? So you, a lot of people are absorbed in things. You might be, if I'm lucky, some of you will be absorbed in the lecture right now. And that doesn't mean that you think it's real when it isn't or something like that. It just, just means that you're... You know, people get absorbed in certain kinds of activities. It could be a Sudoku problem, it just happens to be the theatre. It's very difficult to say what is going on when people are absorbed in the action like that. Because, of course, what you want to do is ask them. 
but asking people uh, brings them out of whatever trance or brings them out of whatever spell they're under. But what you can do is you can look at certain kinds of cases or you can look at certain kinds of examples. So I just want to tell you one example which I rather like. When I was writing this material and I was sharing it with various philosophers, uh, one of the comments I frequently got was, you can't talk about this as a kind of illusion or deception because nobody in their right mind, when they're under the spell, nobody in their right mind really believes that what's going on is in any way true. Once, once they're done, right, what, 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 once the illusion is broken, they just, they, they absolutely, they realise that none of this is true. So here's a kind of little anecdote that I rather like in this relation. So it's a story that's told um, by, uh, was told to and is reported by the playwright Michael Frain. And it's a story about an actor, told from the point of view of an actor, who appeared in a play in the West End. And in the play, the actor appears as a doctor. So he's there, he's performing, he's a doctor. And during the course of the play, somebody in the audience appears to suffer a heart attack. So, of course, what they do is they stop the play, they take the audience member, the unfortunate audience member, to the back of the stage. And at the back of the stage, um, they, they, they then go out to the audience and they say, is there a doctor in the house? And someone puts his hand on and says, I'm a cardiologist. They bring the cardiologist in. So the actor playing the doctor and the cardiologist are looking at the patient. And the cardiologist looks at the patient and says, um, I don't really think this is a heart attack. I think this is absolutely fine. Um, w would you agree with me about that? <laughs> And of course, the, the actor playing the doctor realises that it's him that's being asked. Because the cardiologist, who let's suppose is not you know, completely... I mean, the cardiologist understands what plays are, right? Something of this attitude, something of this experience of um, watching someone being a doctor makes you think that they have medical experience that's worth asking, even if you're a cardiologist. You know exactly what it's like to train as a cardiologist. Now, look, I don't take it that that shows anything... Uh, definite, we'd obviously want to have a much longer conversation about what, you know, what does that demonstrate and so on. But it does, I think, point to something, which is that we're not as good at switching off after watching plays as we might like to think that we are. And uh, that maybe uh, takes us back to where we started, because at the start I was telling you the story of Socrates as he appears on the stage. And in Socrates' apology, as I said at the beginning, in Socrates' apology, as Plato writes it, he begins by saying... It's very difficult to argue against preconceptions that are perhaps implicitly born from the stage. And I thought that example of the Doctor was a nice case in point of that. Because you can tell yourself it's just a play. You can tell yourself that you know, once it's over, we snap ourselves out of the spell and it's done. It's very difficult to get rid of those impressions. It's very difficult to stop yourself associating, say, the expertise that you see the character have with the actor who played that character. OK. Um, I, I have one or two more things that I might add, but I think the most sensible thing at this point is to stop and see if there are any questions. And if there aren't questions, I can say a couple of other things, but I'm hoping that maybe there will be. So I think there's going to be a microphone that's passed around if you have questions, and maybe you can just put your hand up <coughs> if you do. Looks like there's one over there. I was going to ask, with, with regards to like current um, environment, is the sort of ancient theatre, is that like a parallel to what the news would be today? To what the news would be? Yeah. Hmm. Um, that's a very interesting question. So, so, so one of the, the, the question was, um, is, is sort of the way people thought about ancient theatre parallel to the way people think about the news? Um, I'll tell you one parallel that people have made m more recently, which is not to do with the news, but I think it's a very kind of good illustration of the sorts of things the ancients are worried about, and that's computer games. Um, the worry that people have now that somehow um, engaging imaginatively with certain kinds of computer games, especially violent ones or unpleasant ones, uh, that there's something odd about allowing people to do that, that it'll give them the impression that certain things are the case when they aren't, or that it's sort of engaging in that sort of thing could be corrupting, or whatever it is. So I've thought about that a little bit. The idea that it's like the news strikes me as slightly different, because it's self-evidently the point of the news, you might think, to convey certain kinds of information. That's what it's for. <coughs> Whereas there's an argument with theatre that it, it, maybe it can do that, but that's not, as it were... Its purpose, so its purpose isn't directly 
to convey information. So I think when we're worried about the news, we're worried about whether it's doing what it says it's doing. You couldn't, you couldn't imagine someone defending the news on the basis that, well, it may not be true, but you know, it's certainly entertaining. Whereas you can imagine someone saying that sort of thing with plays. So th that's sort of difference, I suppose, I draw. But it's, it's it, certainly something to, you know, to think about. Thank you. Any other there's a question up there? Um, can you say something about what you feel about emotional truth in terms of theatre? Because for a lot of people, that's the truth that they find in it. And that's what allows the illusion to happen because they're emotionally involved, or, although they recognise the facts maybe, or, or the storyline or whatever may be spurious, but the reactions are human and believable. Th thank you. Um, so, so I, I can say a little bit about that. It, 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 um, uh, this is not a, try and, uh, not a way of trying to evade it, but it's a, it's a huge topic. So, I, but, um, so um, one thing to say is that it's true of some theatre, I think, that it's very realistic in that sense and, and, and that the emotions it draws out are very, feel very real to us, but it's not necessarily true of all theatre. So a lot of people are interested in kinds of plays which don't necessarily have an emotional impact. Now, you might say those ones aren't very good plays or they don't do the kinds of things that you want from theatre, but it wouldn't be, I don't think it would be right to say that that's what all plays are doing. Um, I guess the more, more to the point of what you said, uh, one of the things that I discuss, one of the people I discuss in the, um, in the, in, in, in the book is Rousseau, who writes this long letter about theatre where he kind of, amongst other things, rages against the sort of view that you're putting forward. And one of his points is, look, um, feeling in response to things is not something we find very difficult. What we find difficult is um, acting on it. I think acting in response to the emotions, and that there's something very artificial about the idea that um, what you're doing when you sit and watch an action is really that much like what you do when you're actually involved in it in real life. So it might be true that when you're watching the, the play, you, you feel sad or you feel angry or you feel all sorts of things, but there is this question about whether that, that's really a very good likeness of what it would be, say, what it would be if you were involved in it or if you were... Um, uh, uh, actually participating in it in some way. And I suppose um, the, the last thing that people have said about theatre and emotion, which might be, well, we might, m m might be helpful, is um, there's something a bit odd about feeling things for people that you know don't exist. Uh, and whether that reflects, as it were, whether that reflects well on us that we do that, or whether that's something that's nice. Yeah. Um, Yeah, look, and that, absolutely, and that, sorry, sure, so, 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 um, uh, one way of, okay, so that's absolutely one way of responding to it, would be to say, no, okay, you can get emotional and legitimately, because you're really, what you're experiencing is that somehow it's to do with you, it's not to do with them. I mean, I suppose, I think that might be right, but I, I, I sort of, one worry you might have with that is, um, you know, my experience of going to plays and getting emotional in response to them is that I actually, I mean, I'd love to think it was just kind of about me, but I, I think I actually am, I think I'm worried, as it were, about them. I mean, I, I think when there's, a, when there's a plot and I want to know how it resolves, you know, I know how my plot resolves. I mean, I know what's going to be true for me when I leave the auditorium, but I, I actually want to know whether those two people are going to, say, get together or whether that person is going to die. Or, and I actually, my emotions are about that. I mean, it, it makes more sense if they're about me, but I, I'm not sure. I don't know. It, I, yeah, this is the, yeah, there's more, more, more to say, but thank you very much, no, thank you very much for the question. Um, this, um, this is going to be a bit of a vague question. I, I'm thinking in terms of truth, that when we think of something as being true, um, you know, I'm a scientist, and when I think of that, um, it's always a representation, and the representation is always false, um, has aspects that are false. For instance, I have a pencil rolling on a desk, and I think of that in terms of a sphere on, on a table, that there's some elements that are correct, and a lot of elements that I'm just ignoring, or are wrong, or misrepresented, or whatever. So what I'm wondering is, is there really that much of a difference between the truth that you talk about, which is how we think about a representation of where there are some truth elements to it, and theater, which seems like very much the same thing. Hmm. Um, that's a 
That's a great question. Uh, and I suppose I can, uh, I, can, I can gesture at a couple of thoughts about it, but I can't give you a, a response that would be kind of satisfactory, I don't think. But I can say a couple of things. So um, for some people, I think it's just, if, you're talk if what you're talking about is something like a model or, or, or a drawing, so if you, I don't know what kind of science you're w working with, but if it's sort of here's a pictorial representation of what's going on, or here's a, here's a model of what's going on, I think there are very interesting analogies between those models and the reality, the relationship between those models and the reality they're trying to put forward, and uh, the sort of representations that you get on stage compared to the realities that they're trying to put forward. But um, uh, here's one kind of difference. Um, if you went to a performance of Hamlet, and you, think, you want to try to think about Hamlet in relation to the reality, what's the reality? I mean, th there wasn't a real set of events that, that can correspond to a model. There's, there's no real thing for it to have a relationship to. Whereas if I had a, a scientific model, I would think, no, that there's a real thing out there, and this is a sort of artistic representation of it or something like that. So it looks like, perhaps in the theatrical case, it creates its own reality or something like that. You don't have those two, um, two parts to it. Um, but I agree that there's something very similar about them. That there's something similar. I can see why you think it's something similar about them, but it just that seems like an important difference. So, does that answer your worry or not? Um, no. A lot of theoretical models are, for instance, the um, liquid drop model that mm -hmm. we know is wrong. <laughs> you know, but it gives us sort of some type of understanding of uh, some type of feeling that we have some insight into the problem that we, even though it's literally described a situation that we know doesn't mm. exist. Mm. Okay. Well, does it help you to, does it help you to make certain kinds of predictions or does it help you to achieve certain results or know that certain things are going to be the case? Probably. I would say Hamlet does the same. Ah, okay. Well, okay. <laughs> so, okay. Now we've got it. Okay. So if you think that's the case, then, then you need to explain what it helps you do, right? What, what the equivalent things that it helps you actually achieve are. Um, I, as I understand it, we're supposed to finish at this point. So I'm afraid I can't take any more questions. So if we could all just thank Dr. Tom Stern for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.